Welcome to our program. This is Inkscape logo design. I am Anna Kopinska. I am a library instructor and research specialist. And today I have another friend joining me. Caitlin, could you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin and I am also a library instructor and research specialist. I'll be moderating your chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them there. Okay, so. For today's agenda, we are going to be going over logo design theory in this PowerPoint. We're going to be talking about color first because color I think is something that's very accessible for everybody to get into. Uh, then we're going to be talking about typography and different kinds of fonts. Then we're going to be talking about different types of logos and the different reasons why you might choose to use one over the other. That's gonna take us about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how many questions there are. Uh, then we're going to jump right into Inkscape and learn more about the wonderful world of that program. So we have a poll for you today. And I believe Caitlin's gonna bring that up in just a second. We wanna know why you're here for this class. Um, if you want to design a logo for yourself or for somebody else, if you're learning more for just general interest. Ooh. So far the results are pretty exciting in my opinion. We'll give it just a few more seconds for other people to finish voting. Okay. So um, it seems that a lot of us want to design a logo for our personal business uh, or personal brand. And that's very exciting to me. Um, I think that's great. I hope that you get a lot out of this. Others are learning more for just general interest. So we want to think about color. Um, I hope that you all recognize these brands Color can greatly impact how people perceive your company. And these are all companies where color has made a huge impact on their branding. Tiffany & Co. used that color blue on everything, on their packaging and materials and such. And that shade of blue is actually called Tiffany Blue now after the company. Um, and the others are also very iconic as well. So I can let you read over these, but keep in mind, these are color meanings that are true for Western society and color meanings absolutely change when you're in a different culture. But that said, we're gonna take a look at our previous examples. So H&R Block chose green and one of those meanings is abundance, right? So that's not bad if you're trying to convey that you can get people good tax refunds, you can get them an abundant refund. That's, that's pretty great. Tiffany and co have chosen a very specific Tiffany blue color that mixes kind of the blue meanings with the green so they can be responsible and calm and also abundant. Um, so Nickelodeon on the bottom uh, has orange, which Nickelodeon is, if you don't know, is a channel for kids and orange is energy and happiness and vitality. And kids should hopefully be able to relate to that orange color a lot. Do we have any questions or comments at this point, Caitlin? Not at this point. All right. Um, there's definitely more color meanings than just these. Each color kind of has different associations. And each person is also going to associate color slightly differently. Um, 
And keep in mind that these are general meanings specific to Western society. Uh, here we have the UPS logo, which is brown, which hopefully we can depend on UPS to deliver our mail. So I think that that's where they're going with that dependability, brown. Okay, so we're going to switch gears just a little bit and start thinking about typography, um, which is a sort of fancy way of saying font, it's simplified a little bit. So we have serif fonts and sans serif fonts and decorative fonts. Um, serif fonts have little feet. So I hope that you can see on this example uh, where it says classic, you can see the little line extras that kind of extend past the main line of the letter. They're usually, um, I really don't know how to describe them besides feet. You can see the little dot on the A and the little dot on the C in classic. These are just little accents that kind of help the letter look nicer. They don't really have a purpose in distinguishing the letter from others. It's just a little added fanciness to the letter. We also have slab serifs. So you can see here in bold, um, the reason why they're called slab serifs, they're much thicker, kind of like a slab instead of a decorative foot. And the, the slab serif gives us kind of a bold font. Um, many companies have actually switched their logos recently to feature sans serif fonts or fonts that don't have those little feet on the letters. And sans serif fonts can definitely feel a bit more modern. Script fonts feature cursive usually and are often used for special occasions such as weddings. And they give off an elegant feel, a little bit extra fanciness. Handwritten fonts feature more of an informal feel. They feel a bit more personal. I would say. And decorative fonts can feel very dramatic, but it depends on the decorative font. Um, the example here is shown is kind of a bold comic book like font. So we have another poll for you. And there's no right or wrong answer for this one. Um, we just want to know what kind of font you're drawn to. Okay, so it's very interesting. Uh, lots of people all over the place, but Serif Classic is definitely our winner. Um, and that's perfectly great. I love a good Serif font. Um, Times New Roman is, of course, one of the standards that everybody knows. Um, okay, I think we'll keep going. So here we have examples from a lot of companies in logo form. Um, as I mentioned before, many companies have switched now to a sans serif font. So the top row is actually their old logos and the bottom row is actually their new logos. And you can see the bottom row actually looks very similar to each other. All of the fonts basically look the same. Um, Google had a classic serif font for a while before they chose to switch over. Airbnb, I'd say mixed decorative handwritten and script fonts for their old logo. It was a very interesting font choice that they had. Spotify used a bold slab serif font and just moved the O up a little bit. 
and Pinterest used a light script font to highlight their elegance. Um, I think, at least for Pinterest, they used to be the wedding planning site for a while. And I think that they're trying to move away from that. So that might be why they changed their font to something a bit more modern. Other things that we want to think about with typography are if we want to use the font just as is, regular, or if we want it to be bold or italic. So bolded fonts can seem more intimidating and permanent. And italic fonts typically, invade, typically convey a sense of movement or of speed. So Microsoft used to have a bolded italic logo to show that they were fast and moving forward. Um, but now they're just a regular sans serif font to emphasize the clean design and modernity. AutoZone is another bolded italic font. Italics usually mean speed, so you can also think of Nike or USPS. They're promising to deliver their product quickly or that their product will help you move quickly. Um, now that we've covered typography for a little bit, let's look at the different logos. There's actually three different types of logos and seven different subtypes of logos. And these are things that we want to consider when we're making our own. So there are logos that focus on the typography. There are logos that focus heavily on pictures or icons, and then some miscellaneous logos that incorporate elements from both types and icon logos. So first up, we've got letter marks. Uh, letter marks and word mark logos are actually very similar. Letter marks consist of initials, whereas word marks consist of words or names. So you wanna consider, does your business have a long name? Uh, then you might want to consider a letter mark logo because condensing the business name into initials will help customers recall your business and logo as well as simplify your design. So, for example, ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, that would be a lot to try and design around. Or IBM, International Business Machines. They're just not very quick to roll off the tongue. When you say the full name, you want something quick and snappy to stick in people's brains. And to stick out visually as well. So word marks consist of words or names. Um, so if your business name is short and to the point, a word mark is a good decision, especially if you're a new business and need to work on name recognition for your business. Both letter mark and word mark logos are adaptable across marketing material and branding, uh, which makes them highly attractive options for new and developing businesses. Any questions so far? We're still doing good. Okay. So now we're going to switch over to more pictorial icons or icon logos. A pictorial mark alone can be tricky, but it is highly effective if you already have an established brand. So you can see here, they're very simple shapes. Um, the Nike swoosh, the Android robot, I think is the most intricate of these, but it's still effective. Others heavily rely on curves. Um, the circle is very prominently featured in a lot of pictorial marks or circular curves. You can see the, the bite out of the apple is just a bit of a circle. Lots of circles is what I'm trying to get at. Okay. We also have abstract logos. Um, as opposed to pictorial icons, these allow you to completely create a new unique image for your business. So BP, I consider them primarily an oil company, an energy company. This green sunburst has nothing to do specifically with energy, but it kind of gives the idea that they are a green company, that they are focusing on natural resources. Um, we've got Pepsi in the middle. There's nothing about the brown colored drink that specifically says 
red, white, and blue circle. But with this abstract logo, they kind of create their own symbology. And Adidas, again, a sportswear company. I don't necessarily know that I associate sportswear with flowers, or I'm not necessarily sure what this logo is supposed to be. But it is iconic in a way. Other types of icon logos include mascots. So if you're trying to attract families and young children, definitely try a mascot. Mascots are frequently found on food, especially cereal. If I'm thinking of the cereal aisle, I can think of Tony the Tiger and Trix the Rabbit and the Lucky Charms Leprechaun and all of those wonderful uh, mascot characters. They offer a friendly face for your customers to be attached to. And now we're going to move into the miscellaneous types of logos, which include combination marks. Combination marks are a combination of your icon logos and your type logos. So they include both. Um, some of them do it a little bit more separately. So you can see on dominoes, you have the picture floating above and then you have the text underneath. So it's very separated. Others like the Tostitos logo, you can see that they incorporated the icon right into the middle with the two people sharing chips over a bowl of salsa. So a combination mark is a great choice for most businesses because it combines the benefits of type logos and pictorial marks. It's versatile, it's highly unique, and the most popular choice of logos among prominent companies. So if you choose a combination mark, you're in good company. Last but not least, we've got emblems. An emblem logo consists of a font inside of a symbol or an icon. So if you think badges, seals, or crests, these kind of traditional forms. These logos tend to have a traditional appearance about them that can make a striking impact. And thus they are often the go-to choice for many schools, uh, government organizations, and agencies. So the auto industry is also very fond of emblem logos because the shields and circles are symbols of strength and security. An emblem's traditional look can also serve any up and coming private business quite well, especially those in the food and beverage industry or even the automotive industry. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about logo design in Inkscape. But before that, we have a poll. We love getting your opinions and feedback. Okay, so a lot of you have no experience and that's perfectly fine. We're going to be going over everything in a very basic level. And as you can tell from a lot of the logos, simple is better. So the less convoluted we make things, the better it will turn out looking. So we're going to build from very simple shapes. Um, let's talk a bit about Inkscape. Inkscape is a free to download software it's available for multiple platforms, Windows, Mac, and Linux. And it is for vector drawing instead of bitmap drawing. So bitmap or raster images are JPEGs. A lot of us are very familiar with them. If we zoom in too close, you can kind of see the grid and start seeing the pixelation. 
um, because bitmap works off of a grid um, and each square in the grid is a different color and all of those colors make up a larger image. Vector drawing, on the other hand, is more based on math. We don't actually need to know math for vector drawing, but think of your quadratic formulas where, you know, the, the curve is already set for a certain portion of the line, and then it switches at a certain point and goes to a different equation for a different part of the line. Vector drawing is great um, for simple images because, um, and it's great for logos specifically because they can be scaled up or down very easily. You can make a logo the size of a quarter and then scale it up to be billboard size and it's not going to have any pixelation whatsoever because all of those lines are based on mathematical formulas and those stay true no matter how small or big you get. Any questions? None at this time. Okay. So, um, I'm giving you three options. We have PSI or Plano Systems International, a fake company that I made up. We have Crabzilla's, which is also a fake company that I made up. And we have So Crafty, which is a fake company that Caitlin made up. So we're going to share a poll with you in just a second on and ask which logo you would like to see designed in Inkscape. Okay, so as you can see, we have a tie, which is a little bit unfortunate. Um, I think, however, what we're going to do is we are going to learn how to make the crab from Crabzilla's. And then, so Crafty is actually a pretty simple logo to design. So we'll switch over to So Crafty kind of after we've designed the crab. The crab doesn't necessarily have anything to do with So Crafty, but It'll get us there. Um, okay, so before we switch over to Inkscape, um, I did kind of want to talk about the preparation for designing a logo. So here we have Crabzilla's and you can see that I kind of made a mood board of sorts where I went into just your regular Word document and I started looking at different fonts that I wanted to use, I decided on Rockwell Bold, but you can see that I tried a few others just to kind of see the feel that it would give me. And then I also looked at other logos from different restaurants to kind of both separate myself from other restaurants, but kind of also not venture too far away because all of these kind of look a little bit similar. You can see a lot of them have a mascot and I decided that I also wanted to have a mascot as well for Crabzilla's to attract families that wanted to eat together. So I started drawing on regular lined paper and you can see my doodles and what I was thinking. Um, 
some of these are very goofy and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> And I did the same exact thing for So Crafty. I ended up going with a very different font than these that are presented right here. I was initially thinking more of an informal, kind of craftier font, um, a little bit more handwriting. But I ended up going with the sans serif century Gothic. Um, and here's my doodles for So Crafty. I was also thinking maybe a script font, kind of like Michael's, but decided against it because we don't want to look too much like another company. Okay. So I'm going to ooh, open a new document in Inkscape. And whenever you open a new document in Inkscape, it already gives you a page to work on. So you don't really have to worry about that too much. Let's go over the interface a little bit. Um, you can see up top here, I've got file, edit, view, layer, so on and so forth. These are the menu bar. So the menu bar features standard menu options. Right underneath it, I've got my tool control bar. So this tool control bar changes depending on the tool that I select in my toolbox, which is on the left side of the screen. I can also have my commands bar underneath, which I usually like. I'm going to change my view instead of wide to be default. So with the default view, um, which I, did by going to view and then scrolling down to the bottom and seeing that it wasn't on the default, it was on wide instead. The default view gives you the commands bar right underneath the tool control bar. In the middle, we have our canvas. On the right side, we usually have a docking area, and I'm noticing that a lot of my docks are not here. So I'm going to open them by going to the menu bar. I opened up my layers by just clicking on layer and then layers. I'm also going to get my align and distribute by going under object and then align and distribute. I'm going to get my fill and stroke. I don't know how I normally get it, but I know that it's control shift F. So there it pops up. And these are all docs. You can see that we can minimize them or make them smaller or bigger just by clicking on them. Uh, and on the very, very far right, we have something that we're not actually going to talk about during this class, so don't worry too much about it. On the bottom, uh, we have our status bar. So this provides information such as uh, colors, of the selected object, the different layers. You can see here we're on layer one. We have cursor coordinates and zoom levels. So we are going to create first um, the crab from Crabzilla. And first I'm going to zoom in. You can see on the lower right of the status bar, there's a zoom feature. Normally I like using the control key and the zoom scroll wheel. Oh. And it's working today. It was not working yesterday when we tested this out. So I zoomed in quite a little, little bit and I'm going to go to my toolbox and select circles, ellipses, and arcs. And I'm just going to create kind of an oval shape. Now with this shape um, right now, it's considered a shape. I want this shape instead to be considered a path. Paths we can 
C have anchor points and anchor points are those points that I was talking about earlier with vector drawing where we can see the quadratic formula line kind of change depending on where we are in the point. That's a very confusing explanation. Um, I will convert this to a path by clicking object to path. And now when I use my node tool, you can see I can move these around. And by moving the points around, I can change how they are affecting the curve. So right now I'm just altering the top point. Um, if I wanted to, I could click on these handles and you can see that by dragging the handles, the curve wants to follow that point, that handle basically. Um, that said, I'm going to scooch that down and move the bottom one so that we kind of create the body of our crab. And it's as simple as that. Next up, we're going to create the claws. So we're going to create two more circles. One, two, and the second one I'm going to change colors to be any color really. I just chose purple because it stood out. Um, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to create the claw. So the red is going to be the claw part. I'm going to select both of them by holding down the shift key and clicking on both of them. And then up top under path, I'm going to make sure that they are paths. So object to path. And then I'm going to select difference. And you can see that it gave me a crescent moon shape of sorts. Now I'm not sure that I love that shape so much, but I can always change it a little bit by moving these points around with my node tool, which I selected um, without telling you, sorry. Any questions at this point, Caitlin? We do have a question. Okay. It's about, um, after you're completed with a logo though, mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you know how they might go about getting it trademarked or protected? once it's created? I unfortunately do not. Um, I believe. If I may break in just a second, y'all. Yeah, please do, Bob. So um, I, I'm not prepared to give you specific details about that, but um, that information is fairly easily available from the website of the US Patent and Trademark Office. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That was Bob, a librarian who works at Haggard Library. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Moving back to our crab. Um, I've decided that I don't want this claw crab to be quite as pointy. So you can see up here uh, when I have my node tool selected, that I can alter the points by making the selected node smooth instead of pointy. So I'm going to do that and zoom in a little bit more. And there we go. That's a much friendlier crab claw. We want it to look intimidating, but not too intimidating so that the kids aren't scared of it. Because remember, we're creating this mascot design so that kids want to eat here. I'm going to copy this. Um, I believe I can duplicate it by clicking on one of these. Aha, it's under the edit menu under duplicate. So it's control D, which is what I was trying to do, but I don't know how people feel about all of the different shortcut keys and I'm flipping it over by just clicking and dragging on these little handles in the other side. If I click again 
on the shape that I want, um, I can go ahead and rotate it, which I'm going to do. And you can see here we have the beginnings of a very promising crab claw. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to unite these so that they are one shape instead of two. And I'm going to do that by going to the menu bar and clicking on path union. And now they are one shape. I'm going to create some little triangles. Um, so when I clicked on the polygon tool, it automatically wanted to create a star. Stars are great, but they're not really what I'm looking for. I want triangles to make the little bumpy ridges on my crab claw. So I'm going to delete that shape. Um, and I'm going to say that I want three corners here in the tool control bar and I want a polygon. So when I click and drag, theoretically, I have my point. Again, that looks a little bit too intimidating. I think that I want my triangle to be a little bit more rounded. Woo. <laughs> I'll get there eventually, I'm sorry. <laughs> So I guess I want it to be rounded around 1.8 or 0.18 rather. Um, and I'm going to duplicate these by using control D and just moving it a little bit, rotating, control D, move it a little, rotate, control D again, move and rotate a little bit and there. I'm going to take all of these and unite them with my crab claw by going to path and then union. And there, our crab claw has the little ridges now. So I'm going to move this crab claw over. And now I need to make the little arm that connects the crab claw to the body. And then I'm going to duplicate it for the other side as well. So I can do that by creating another circle. And I'm going to go ahead and make it red. I'm going to change this object to path. And then with my node tool selected, I'm going to drag this guy on the right side, way, way, way over. And that kind of gives me that curve shape that I want. I don't know that I want it to be quite that long, but I can move it over right over there. And I think that looks like a good little crab claw. You can feel free to disagree. Um, I'm going to unite the crab claw with its little arm by going to path union. And then I'm going to duplicate. We're going to edit duplicate. And then I believe under object, I can flip horizontal. And there we have my little crab claw. Next up, we need to make the legs. Or actually, let's give this crab some personality and give him eyes. The eyes are very simple, just two black circles. But I think they give him a lot more personality already. He's a little character now. So to make the legs, I'm going to make sure that I've got a red crab again. I'm going to create more of these ellipses. Going to go to path, object to path to make it a path. And then once again, I'm going to, woo. I'm 
move the points around until I get something that looks like a crab leg to me. And that looks about right. So I'm going to move this guy over and duplicate him a lot by doing control D and just rotating. That. I'm going to select all of the legs by holding down the shift key and clicking on them. Once they're all selected, I'm going to go back to path and unite them. And then I can rotate them all and attach them to the body. Now, I made them a lot thicker than I did the previous one, so I'm not actually sure how much I love this, but it's good enough for the sake of a demonstration. Um, I duplicated that and now I'm going to object flip horizontal. And there's our crab, wonderful. We can of course unite all of these elements together now that they're here. And then all that we would have to do left is just write down Rabzilla's instead of crab because the claw is our C. Um, and there we have the Crabzilla's logo, more or less. So now let's talk about So Crafty. Um, I'm going to scroll down just a little bit and I'm actually going to import by going to File Import. And I believe this is under documents, work. I want this. I'm basically finding um, the sketches that I did of So Crafty's logo. Because what I want to do now is I want to put these on a separate layer. So I'm going to actually keep this layer and create a new one. So if you don't have the layers panel in your docking area, you can do shift control L at the same time and it'll pop up. Or you can go up here to layer and then layers. Um, I'm going to add a layer by clicking on this little plus sign. I'm going to say layer two, position is above the current layer, which is what I want. Layers are kind of like transparencies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this first layer a lot less transparent. So, hmm, how to explain this? With layer one selected, I'm going to bump this opacity down a lot so that it's kind of see-through-ish. And now working on layer two, that's where I'm going to create my So Crafty logo. First, I'm going to use text to write out So Crafty. And I'm going to make the box big enough to actually fit the words. Um, I'm going to highlight all of the text and I'm actually going to select Century Gothic. So you can see here a problem that I had initially was with this Y. The Y is very curvular and I wanted to extend that tail of the Y to go down and around. So instead of so crafty, I'm actually going to write so craft do. And we're going to create the tail of the Y using the pen tool. So with all of these selected, I'm going to make sure that my text is aligned center. And I did that by going into the tool control bar. Any questions, Caitlin?
Not at this time. All right. I'm going to make my font quite a bit smaller, maybe not that small, so that it kind of more or less aligns with The, the way that I wrote out so crafty. So maybe just a little bit smaller. Okay. Another thing that I'm going to do to this font, goodness, maybe, it takes a lot of clicking <laughs> to select it. Um, I'm going to separate out the letters a little bit. So here in the tool control bar, you can see there's spacing between letters. I'm going to increase that. And I think that I made so crafty bold. Yeah, that seems right. Okay, so I scrolled in a little bit more so that I could follow the path of this line and then I could trace out this needle. So you can use this pencil tool right over here to kind of draw out the line. Usually this doesn't work so well, but that, that for me is not bad. That for me is actually very, very good. That said, it's still not very smooth. You can see it's rather jaggedy in places. So what I'm going to use instead is I'm going to use the pen tool, which allows me to draw Bezier curves in straight lines. I'm going to start my point right at the top of the U. And then you can see that I have this line that's kind of following around my cursor and it's waiting for me to select another point. So I'm going to draw a point right over here. And by clicking and dragging, I can control how much curve there is to this line. So I'm going to create another point here. Another point here and another point there. And then I believe if I hit, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. I hit escape and it ruined everything. <laughs> so. Let's try that again. I'm going to hit enter to finish the path and you can see that it's a lot smoother. It's not quite as smooth as I wanted. It's still a little, it moves around a little bit much for me, but that's okay. I'm going to make sure that this line is black. Ah. It is black. The reason why it looks gray is because it's on layer one instead of layer two. So that's a pro tip. Make sure you're working on the right layer when you're doing this. Okay. If I scroll up, I believe under stroke style, I can change the width of my line so that it's roughly the same width as the rest. I'm going to fix my nodes because my goodness, this is terrible.
And then I'm not sure why it's cutting out like that. Probably something that I did wrong. But basically, you do the same for the bottom line where you create more. Enter. Make sure that the width is the same as this guy. So this width is 0 0.762. Okay, I'm going to make this guy 0 0.762 as well or 0.765, that's close enough. I can then, woo, move everything around apparently, which is not what I was trying to do. I can then select the text and the two lines and go to path union. And usually that unites everything. But it's wanting to be difficult today. Okay. We can also group things instead of uniting them. Uniting them kind of creates this permanent bond between them, whereas grouping them lets you ungroup them at a later time. So we can also go to object group. And here is where I decided to be kind of creative with my color. I chose a blue color. Mm. Not what I wanted. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm going to go to object and ungroup to fix this. I'm going to select this and this, make sure that the fill is set to nothing and that the stroke paint is set to color and it's not wanting to let me choose that color. Okay. 42, 212, 255, and 100. Okay, with no fill. Are there any questions, Caitlin? Not at this time, but you're doing great. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ah. I'm going to scroll back over, make sure that I have black selected, and now I'm going to use the pen tool one last time zooming in super close to create this needle. And I'm just clicking and dragging to make these points. That kind of follow more or less the shape that I want. I hope that you can see on your screen that I am following a guide. I'm following this thin green line, which is what I know is going to be the final shape. Did I do this on layer one again? I sure did. Okay, that's fine. We are going to Copy, paste, and then delete that guy. Yes, this guy is now on layer two. 
It's just that his opacity is way down. So with the node tool, I can go ahead and change up the points quite a bit. And I could keep fiddling with them until they're completely perfect, but for now, that's more or less good. Ugh. I say that and then I keep fiddling around with things. Okay. And that's how I created the So Crafty logo, more or less. Um, any questions at this point? Yes. When you're drawing with the pen, do you drag, then stop and click, and then continue to drag to crest the points? Okay, with the pen tool. Um, I'm going to try to create a simple heart right now. I'm going to click and then drag it. Then I'm going to click and I'm still holding down the click and dragging it while I'm clicking. And that gives me the ability to create this curve. I'm going to let go of my click right now. And then I'm going to continue dragging uh, or moving the cursor rather. And then I'm going to click and drag. I'm going to let go of my click. I'm going to keep going with the mouse. I'm going to click. Because it's a point and I know that I don't want it to be a curve, I'm not going to click and drag, but I am going to move the cursor a little bit over here to click and drag while I'm making this other part. Then I'm going to go up top and click and drag. Woo. It's a bit of a lopsided heart, but I hope that gives you <laughs> the the idea. We have another question. Mm -hmm. When you're saving this file, are all layers saved or just your logo? All layers are saved. Um, they're saved as an SVG file, which stands for scalable vector graphic. So if you wanted to completely get rid of layer one, you can hit this eye icon right next to it and it makes it invisible. So now when you save it, then you won't see the, the bottom half. Did that make sense? I believe so. Okay. Well, it's been an hour, so if there are no more questions, I wanted to thank you all for spending this time with us. Um, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. You can definitely find more resources on our Plano Library website, and there's also our blog, planolibrarylearns.org. So we hope to see you there, um, and I'm available for more questions if there are some. If not, I hope that you all have a great day. We did have one last question for okay. how to implement this on a card. Um, I do want to go ahead and jump in and say that uh, we are going to have a, a, car, a class on creating business cards in two weeks. Um, on Monday, the, let's see if I can get my calendar up, Monday the 24th. So you can definitely take what you've learned today in Anna's class and learn how to use that logo on a business card format. Definitely. Otherwise, um, you can, in Inkscape, I had that beautiful end screen and now I'm going back. You can go ahead and do File, Export, PNG Image. Uh, PNG is recognized by most graphics places 
once you export it, um, you can open that file on any business card making website or if you're using Publisher or Word or InDesign, like Caitlin's going to teach, you can use that logo directly in there.